everybody. I am excited to talk about learning styles with you all. And today I'd like to title this outdated yet still in fashion learning styles. Um, so I'd actually like to get us all started off just talking or sharing. So I'd love to hear from you all. What's your style with learning styles on the TESOL course? How does it come up? Is it something you bring up? Is it something participants bring up? How do you find this piece of theory finding its way into the work we do? Feel free to share in chat. Feel free to unmute. Josh avoids the term. Interesting. Shifting it over to learning preferences. I think we're headed in the same direction. Thinking about it in terms of variety. Nice. Something taken for granted. That's something I've found a lot, Holly. I feel like if I had to make a small cash bet, I would bet on participants of this course knowing this theory more probably than like any other learning theory. I feel like 95% of the people we get into, so what do you know about yourself as a learner? I'm visual. And you're like, oh, great. And I don't know how it spreads so widely. I want to know what marketing job VARC had and how I get my ideas that well marketed. I want 95% of teachers to know the things that I want to tell them about. So if anyone has that figured out, please let me know in our next practice group. Mm. Um, and yeah, that it can lead to some confirmation bias there too. Um, and so I think this is something I hear a lot of you all talking about. We have a lot of participants who show up with this very strong idea about themselves, about learning, and they have fancy words to talk about it. And that can make them very confident in these fancy words. And we as education or learning professionals might have a slightly different approach to that. So how do we take someone from where they're at and bend them there? Well, I wanna share a process and a resource that I've been using to help bring participants along a journey that I've been on myself because I was a visual learner. When I was learning to play guitar, sorry, Marbella, you're gonna have to tell a story about learning to play guitar too. So when I was learning to play guitar, I told my friend, Kurt, I'm visual. If you don't print out this song on a piece of paper and let me see the chords, I can't learn it. I've since come to realize that I was hiding behind my own preference. I was using my strength as a mathematician or as a writer to avoid my lack of musical literacy, right? And so I wanna share the journey that kind of brought me out of the learning styles rut and how I've been do using that same resource on the TESOL course. So this is a screenshot from one of my favorite YouTube channels. Have any of you wandered upon Veritaserum, Ver Veritasium, Veritasium? Hard to pronounce, great channel. Um, so this guy is a scientist out of the Bay Area, and he's been making videos for a decade. Um, and one of the things I really recommend about this channel, if you can see over here, this is the works cited bibliography for this one YouTube video. So one of the things I really appreciate about his channel is, to me, it feels like an academic journal presented visually, which I think is really helpful for my population who are often ESL teachers speak who are also second language speakers, right? And their own language abilities might prevent them from accessing these journals that are written to a higher level. And so I love this channel because it supports the content of these really great academic journals with wonderfully produced visuals and experiences as well. So I'm going to send out a link to that video as well. I'm not going to have us watch it. It's 15 minutes long but I'm gonna sum up some key parts and how I've been using it. Um, but I've been using this video in the place of the reading that I used to use on VARC. So instead of giving participants a reading about a theory that I now consider outdated, I give them this video that explores where this theory comes from and why it might be outdated. So to give you a quick summary, it starts off with this great experiential piece um, where the host gives this sample activity that is really easy to recreate in PowerPoint, where you try and get people to remember 10 objects, and you can play to their strengths by either giving them a visual support or an auditory support um, or some kind of kinesthetic tactile support. Uh, and then it also goes through some research review 
on since the dissemination of this BART concept, what actual research has been done? And it really visually shows that students who follow their learning preference do not do better, right? That there's no research behind VARC at all. Um, and this was really fascinating to me that really what came up was when there was a matching between the problem at hand and the input method, it made sense. If my student is learning about geography, they're going to need a visual support. That's a realm in which visuals tie into maps, right? No matter how auditory of a learner you are, I can't describe for you the Amalfi Coast well enough for you to draw a map of. Um, and so what really stuck out for me is a quote at the center of this, as this host digs up, where did Vark come from? It comes from a guy named Neil Fleming. I'm pretty sure he's not here, so I'm gonna go in. So these two quotes, but blew my mind when I first watched this. Um, and they, they're from Neil Fleming himself, not the host. Neil said, I was puzzled. And Neil, by the way, is just a principal. He's a principal from a school in South Africa. Um, so that's his chops. I think I got that right from the video. Um, and he said, I was puzzled when I observed excellent teachers who did not reach some learners and poor teachers who did. I decided to try and solve this puzzle. There are, of course, many reasons for what I observed. But one topic that seemed to hold some magic, some explanatory power, was preferred modes of learning, modal preferences. When I saw this, that the root of Vark is one principal saw something that he would describe as magic, and that since then, any research review of this theory has ha had it hold no water, it really shook me up. Why is this the piece of theory that all of our teachers know? And they know it in a very simple way that I find can often be reductive, right? When I call myself a visual learner, I'm making judgments about myself and I'm potentially preventing myself from future learning opportunities. So I've been watching this video on the TESOL course with teachers. I break it up into five minute chunks. We do a little pre-discussion question. We watch the chunk and then we talk about it um, and work through it there. Um, and then, what comes next? I think a lot of the ideas you've shared in chat are where I'm at, right? Once we've shown teachers, hey, this thing you really believe in, there's not really science behind it. Like it's magic. If it helps you, great. Like I believe in magic too. And if magic is going to help you, use that magic. But I also think it's important as educational scientists that we're not selling magic on a daily basis. Um, so one of the things that this has led me to is in the same way as a lot of you have found a lot of terminology shifting to move from learning styles to learning preferences, right? That this is my preference. Um, one of the things I think about is how can I compare my preference for input method to my preference for working dynamics? Some students prefer to work with their friends. Some students prefer to work alone. And sometimes when a student works with their friend, they work better. And sometimes when a student works alone, they work better, right? So myself as a teacher, when I'm working with my students' preferences, I have to approach that with complexity and understanding when is it a right time to let my students lean into their preference? And when do I have space as a teacher or coach to push my learners outside of their preferences? So that's one of the things I'm thinking about. Um, and I think that really helps, especially when connecting with teachers. I think most adult teachers have had a moment when they've had to separate a group of teenage friends in the classroom. And they've known that that was the best decision from learning. So for me, drawing that parallel there empowers me as a coach to say, I know you're very visual. And in this moment, I want you to try and use something that's a little bit more auditory, right? I think that approach to preferences helps. I've also experimented with following up the VARC video from Veritasium with some readings about a multiple intelligences, which is a theory that I find much more in line with science and this idea of preference, this idea that we develop intelligences in different realms, and that I might have a preference towards visual learning because I have a highly developed visual intelligence. 
And so whenever you give me something visual, I feel like a star, right? And so when I can recognize that about myself, I can start to see my musical intelligence not as a limiting factor, but as an opportunity for development. And I can start challenging myself to learn the guitar with my eyes closed and use this tool to develop my brain in interesting ways. Um, I've also been thinking about how to connect this to differentiated instruction. One of the other topics that came up earlier that a lot of folks were sharing was on providing diversity. I know that's one way we've had VARC come up on the course in the past. Look at your lesson plan, label everything. Where is their visual input? Where is their auditory input? And using that as a way to push towards a diversity of input um, and a diversity of options, which can start seeding the, the field for differentiated instruction. So that's where I'm at right now with VARC. Um, I think it's a really interesting myth and I also think as educators, we're alive at a time when the broader social construct of how do we take a piece of information that we've encountered somewhere and potentially internalized, and how do we deconstruct that with new information and put it back together in a way that serves us more? I think that's a really powerful social process to go through. And so I think VARC is this really nice ecosystem where we can practice that debunking of a, a myth. Um, so again, I think there's, there's something nice here. And there's always going to be a magic alongside with learning, alongside with the science. So if it's working for you, if it's working for your students, I'm not trying to take that magic away. But I also think this is a really safe and powerful realm that we can explore with teachers moving beyond their preconceived notions. So that's where I'm at with VARC. I hope I've given you enough for your minute of focused note taking. If I haven't, please feel free to give me feedback on my memes. <laughs>